Professor Les Heathcote from University, Flinders University in Adelaide, Australia. It's a great privilege to have you here, Les. It's a long way to Australia from Europe. Hmm. Today, I'd just like you to tell me something of your own background, where you come from, and what were some of the formative influences on your particular style of geography? Well, thank you, Anne. It's a pleasure to join you today, and particularly on such a beautiful day here in Paris. Um, well, I was born in England in the northwest part of Derbyshire. Um, my contact with geography was through school, of course, and uh, really, I suppose, going on to university in geography was in part by chance. It was a subject which, of the three I took, seemed to be the best one I had. Um, general interest in the subject, but I must admit that by the end of my undergraduate uh, period at the University College in London, uh, with no reflection on my teachers, um, I had had enough of geography and I was in a sense very pleased uh, to have the chance to get away from it. And at the time I completed my studies there in 1955, it was a time when, of course, uh, national service was required in Britain. And so I had then two years in the British Army, in national service. And I had, by chance, the very good fortune of going to Cyprus, which is a beautiful island, in my view. Um, I think one of the most, has most of the attractions one could hope for, for an island, in the sense that um, it has high mountains, forests, it has the uh, possibility of skiing. In fact, the British Army taught me to ski, and that was at the time when Mr. Khrushchev was uh, threatening dire retribution on Europe, so we thought maybe we were going to be sent to Siberia. Luckily, we weren't, uh, but we were taught to ski. Um, it has wonderful beaches. It has the famous old city of Salamis, which the earthquake dropped below sea level, and you can go scuba diving. And see all uh, the archaeological remains there, but it also has a uh, rather interesting semi-arid area in the rain shadow of the Trudos Mountains. And during a truce in the uh, internal period of unrest at the time of Enosis and the Oka, um, there was a period of truce and with uh, two other comrades I hired bicycles and we went round the island sort of sleeping in people's backyards and vineyards and so on, and that, I suspect, renewed my interest, particularly in the arid or semi-arid environment. And uh, as a result of renewed interest and having renewed contacts with Professor Darby, who was the professor at the University College, I suspect largely through his good offices I was able to get a scholarship, a Fulbright scholarship, to go on to the University of Nebraska. But Les, before you leave Cyprus now, the, the, the experience of that uh, geographical environment which you described very mm. well here, was that very different from what you had been taught as an undergraduate that geography was? Um, yes, it, it, uh, in a sense it, it brought things alive which up to then had just been things on paper. We had had uh, a very good training in geography. We had had uh, experience on the continent in field trips and so on. In fact, I have a photograph uh, of our field trip which went to Germany under Professor, now Professor Zinhuber, in, in, now in Vienna. Mm. And on that photograph is Professor Mabagunji uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Darby, of course, and mm. uh, Professor Zinhuber and so on. And also uh, Brian Berry in the mm -hmm. same photograph. We had a, a group at the same time from LSC who were doing the Bachelor of Economics in Geography and Brian was amongst them. Um, yes, it, it, it brought it alive and I think just seeing these new landscapes and realizing that they pose different questions and to try and explain them would need, uh, was a challenge and I think the idea of uh, man and aridity and the problem of coping with that uh, first began an interest which um, maybe was latent, dormant, and was that, that experience suddenly brought it into focus. So you got your fellowship to America then? Well, uh, yes, Nebraska. it was a, a, fr a <coughs> Fulbright scholarship um, uh, to Nebraska, and I had uh, two years there, um, 
under Professor Leslie Hughes, uh, and I joined a fellow student at that time as Martin Bowden, mm -hmm. who had been at University College, but just because of the, the timing. Uh, I think he actually was a, a couple of years behind me at University College, but because of my time in the Army, we came together mm -hmm. in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, and we shared a room together for two years, so we, we survived that experience. Um, but we had a very uh, interesting time there. Um, both of us, I think, appreciated the Great Plains environment particularly, and uh, it renewed my interest in the way in which, if you like, uh, a European-based uh, culture had tried to come to grips with what was essentially a rather new, or at least a different environment, between the semi-arid, subhumid fringe. Mm -hmm. And um, Leslie Hughes uh, put both Martin and myself onto a body of data which we used um, this was a body of uh, historical data of a farm loan company which was operating in the 19th century, 1880s, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And which gave very, and as a process of lending money to farmers, uh, had produced very detailed uh, field notebooks for the guidance of its uh, surveyors, I suppose you would call them. Mm -hmm. uh, and Martin was able to use these as part of his interest in the developing chaining land use in the Middle Eastern part of, of Nebraska. And I was particularly interested in them because they gave an evaluation of the land mm -hmm. in the sense of actually both dollars and cents at one stage, but also in terms of a land grade. And this was an evaluation of the land's agricultural potential. Mm -hmm. And the thing which had disturbed me a little bit about previous work I'd seen in, in what we would now think of as perception was the lack of any real attempt to try to I hesitate to use the word quantification because it means so much now more than it did when I was trying to do this sort of work. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the lack of any attempt to put numbers or to put some relative objective evaluation onto the appraisal of places. And this body of data, farm loan company records, gave a very useful, fairly large body of data um, for most of eastern Nebraska, and even stretching up, I think, into part of the Dakotas, um, about this time, 1870s and 1880s, where you could actually put a relative value on land at that time, and you could then go back, and as I tried to do in a, my MA thesis, you could then go back to the original serve land survey documents where there was some attempt at classifying the soil, first, second, and third mm -hmm. class. You could compare that with this 1870, 1880 material, and you could try and bring it up to the present time or the, the 1940s, the sort of land use capability studies. Mm -hmm. And you could, in fact, build up for a limited area. I took a couple of counties just for the sake of a sample area. You could build up a series of profiles of the relative evaluation of, for example, the bottom land and the upland and the rolling loose mm -hmm. hills and so on. And those changed through time as a, a function of various things, technology, discovery of water. Uh, transport change and so on. So you could actually document it, and you mm -hmm. could say this was more or less than that, and how much and so on. So that was uh, one of the, plus the sort of experience of going with fellow colleagues, uh, students on field trips, and also privately uh, through the Great Plains and the Nebraska Sand Hills mm -hmm. and all this country. We sort of. Mm. But you did an inno innovative thing with that data, Les, and maybe not everybody uh, knows about it. it. You didn't do a traditional geographic study, land evaluation. You, you looked at the perceptions of people, how mm. people perceived mm. things. Mm. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about just that, that? I think it was an innovative step that both you and Martin took mm. at that time long before we ever heard of perception in, mm, in the mm. field. Would you like to talk a little yes. bit about it? Well, I think both Martin and myself um, uh, were influenced or uh, had been impressed by John Kirtland Wright's work, of course, and Geosophy. In fact, I call my thesis a historical geosophy of two Nebraska counties. Uh, I'm not sure whether it was a an original use, it was, I mean, it was, it was from John K. Wright's use of the term. Uh, and of course, people say, oh, it's, it's too close to theosophy, you shouldn't yes. have that 
so we, I don't sort of shout too loud about that. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, it, it, well, it was just as, as a, an attempt to try to see and to identify the different points of view about the environment. Um, you had the surveyors, the official surveyors. You then had this private company mm -hmm. surveying it for very, in a sense, fairly material purposes in terms of agri what, what they were trying to assess was the agricultural productivity potential of this area. Mm. And this was in terms of their thinking at the time. And this, of course, changed over time, and it was perhaps uh, enabled me to recognize the need to identify the various points of view mm -hmm. about an area which mm -hmm. you would need to try and study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you went to Australia. Right away after no, I, f I finished uh, in Nebraska in uh, sort of the mid-year. Um, I went back to England and I taught to, at a local high school for a term till the Christmas of '59, uh, and then I went out to the National University in Canberra in early in the year of in 1960, I and I did my doctorate there uh, under Professor Spate, oh. and actually. Um, uh, for part of the time I was there, uh, Joe Jennings was my effective supervisor, and I, I just heard uh, a couple of days ago that he rather sad, tragically he, he's just died. He's, he, he is um, one of the great geomorphologists, but he was very, as a uh, doctor father, you would say in German, mm, yes. uh, he was a very uh, inspiring person mm. to, to be in contact with. Mm. And then. Um, Professor Spake came and took over when he, he, he was overseas for a year and he came back and I was working under him. I see. And the thesis subject? Well, um, when I saw the chance of going to Australia, I saw an advertisement um, it, while I was in Nebraska for scholarships at the National University. And um, I was already, through the Nebraska experience, very interested in, particularly in the semi areas of the Cyprus, Nebraska, reinforce its interest in. Europeans on the edge of the desert, if you like, and the difficulties and the problems they faced, uh, practical problems, mental problems, of adjusting and coping with the stresses of the environment. Um, the chance of going to Australia uh, seemed to fit logically. Yes. And so when I went to Australia, I really tried to do the very, a rather similar sort of thing, um, again trying to document uh, a bit more precisely, change in attitude and evaluation of places over time. And the study, the Back of Burke study, was of an area of northwestern New South Wales and southwestern Queensland, which was the local name was the Warrego country because it focused on the Warrego River, which, mm -hmm. like all good Australian rivers, flows when it rains. The rest of the time it's a series of mud puddles uh, down through the countryside. Um, that's, that's not fair. Mm. They're water holes. They're very good water holes, but it's not a flowing river. Yes. Um, and there the, the documentation was based on a series of uh, government reports uh, in good Australian fashion whenever there was a problem, whether it was a problem in the coal mines, dockers, uh, agricultural settlement, they formed a select committee or a royal commission. Mm -hmm and as a result of which there was a whole series of data collected together, evidence given. And in the turn of the century, there was a major drought in the interior of Australia which affected the prospects of land settlement and re mm. required a major royal commission, which massive source of evidence, great volume of stuff. Um, so then I, that encouraged me to look at this particular area, and I chose this semi-arid area lying astride these, this political division because Australia, even now, is not one unity. It's a series of in effectively independent states in terms of their land use policy and so on, land management policy, to try and see if there's any major difference between the two in the, within this semi-arid zone. The data that uh, was mainly available were the rental assessments, because this is all pastoral leasehold country. It's never been sold, unlike, of course, the United States. Mm -hmm. And you had of a series of years from the 1850s through to when I was working on them into the late 1950s, almost a hundred years of record of different, of, of the evaluation of 
the rental to be paid on the leasehold. Now that rental, in effect, was an assessment of the pastoral production potential, yeah. grazing stock yeah. numbers and so on. And that, again, you could, be, if you took the basic pattern of terrain, different types of terrain and associated vegetation associations, um, you could then compare that with the evaluation over time. And again, you had this fluctuation which reflected the obvious thing was the artesian basin discovery in the 1880s, which immediately meant that water was no longer a problem. Up to then, water had been the main limiting factor. Mm -hmm. uh, thereafter, water was no longer a problem. Then, thereafter, the vegetation became more important and so on. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But, sorry. You, you've, you've looked mainly at the objective assessments as recorded in, mm -hmm. say, the managerial interest. Have you looked into the occupants' perceptions? Well, the other side of, um, uh, two sides to that, one in the actual uh, royal commissions, particularly in the 19th century in Australia, and I suspect in other parts of the, the, the British colonial areas, the Royal Commission not only published its report of its findings, but usually in the 19th century they published the minutes of evidence. Mm -hmm. And quite often in terms of volume of material, it's the minutes of evidence are many times the size of the original report. Now in the minutes of evidence, you have everyone who ever gave any evidence to the Commission, what they said uh, precisely written down. So every farmer, every pastoralist, every stock and station agent, what he said is written down there. A very impressive body of data which is what lends itself of course now to uh, very detailed content analysis. When I was working it was a case of a, a rather more uh, quick overview of, of opinions but of course quoting and so on. Yeah. Uh, opinions. It's very interesting to see people who said something one day and then came back the next day and said, but I didn't really mean that, it meant something else. But of course, the record is there and the, you've got both the two sorts of opinions. So that's one thing. The, so that was a very useful source of, well, uh, one day I'll write a paper which will be called Interviewing the Dead, which will be looking at the, uh, the, these yes. sorts of information yes. uh, because it's, it's still a very valuable source. Of the other thing which I came across by chance was a, a very stimulating series of, well, just one book at the time, but then a subsequent a series of stimulating series of books by the Australian um, art historian Bernard Smith. Mm -hmm. And his thesis, Place, Taste and Tradition, um, was, in my view, a, a sort of a, a masterly uh, review of the way in which the art in the broadest sense, well, really, he was talking about graphic art uh, of the Pacific, uh, particularly the, the British and the French, had reflected attitudes to the Pacific, mm -hmm. which showed through the paintings and so on. And uh, through his ideas, I in, tried to incorporate, looking back on it now very crudely in that Backerberg study, um, the general attitudes to the Australian environment that were evident sort of through the art historians' interpretations of, of their meaning uh, in that. So that, in a sense, the thesis, the Backerberg study, was in three, uh, three different scales. The first scale was a sort of a general overview, look, looking at secondary sources about what had happened in the interior and how it had been assessed and evaluated, but incorporating Bernard Smith's the art historian's view of, of recognition of environment through art, art history. Mm -hmm. Then the sort of the detailed stuff of the, uh, the pastoral um, rental assessments over time, and then finally focusing in on a, a very small case study of actual, well, <laughs> mm -hmm. it was small in the sense of relation to the rest of Australia, but it was a, a pastoral property of a million acres in the 1880s, which had very detailed records so he could actually uh, see to what extent it, this case study, reflected a broader pattern of things. Uh, to what, luckily, yes. <laughs> it seemed to fit reasonably well. Yes. Um, yes. That was a rich and complex endeavour. It seems to me you have just as much an interest in history and the historical ah, yes. development of things as you do yes. in just any synchronic snapshot. Yes, yes. Well, that, of course, mm. I suspect uh, I owe to Professor Darby and his yes. colleagues back at University College who yes. did a very good job in in selling us that uh, 
the yeah, recognition that to see, to understand the present, you must look in part to the past. Of course. Mm. Have you done some comparative work or plan comparative work between, say, the Great Plains of North America and Australia, mm. the arid environments and mm. semi-arid environments? Mm. Yes, um, not as much as I would like. It's again, that's a project mm. in the future. But uh, two areas. One, a fairly early study which was of uh, an attempt to compare pastoral uh, development between the American Southwest, really, mm. as a whole, and very, very broadly defined Southwest, arid USA, and Australia, um, which was called the, the pastoral ethic, which mm. was a study of uh, or trying to see if there was in fact a, a distinctive ethic in the resource management in the pastoral context. And I think there was, certainly in the 19th century, rather exploitive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the 19th century they could get away with it in the short term, but the consequences of, 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 uh, are now still with us, of mm -hmm. course, the long-term mm -hmm. impacts of exploitation of the rangeland. Mm -hmm. And more recently, a, a very brief uh, paper comparing um, that again, at a fairly elementary level at this stage, the depiction and uh, evaluation of the landscapes of the Great Plains in Australia through landscape paintings, a, a paper in, in the Great Plains mm -hmm. Quarterly. So mm -hmm. At a, a, very, a, further, a fairly elementary level, tries to see that there are some interesting parallels in terms of um, how the uh, societies, through their painters, uh, reflect attitudes to environment. Yes. This is what's exceptional, I think, about your approach to perception, a word that's used to mm. mean so many different sure. things. You're not uh, confined to interaction with, say, psychology and uh, sociology in your interpretations. You uh, go into the humanities and painting for mm. insight. Mm. Can, you, can you elaborate a bit on that? Um. Well, as I say, the interest, in a sense, came through my contact with the works of Bernard Smith, mm -hmm. and uh, both my wife and I have got a sort of a hobby, it's an interest in landscape painting uh, mm -hmm. as a means of uh, depicting and communicating ideas about the environment, um, so that we are both uh, interested in trying to use this. In fact, part of the time while I'm here in Paris, I hope to of course, make the pilgrimage to the Louvre and, uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, get the good word there. Mm -hmm. um, but we're trying to look at the role of landscape painting, and I've just been on a commission, um, Geography Tourism in the uh, Alps, mm -hmm. and of course the, there was quite a significant role of landscape painting in developing tourism, in the sense that uh, in many cases, particularly the uh, eight, late 18th, uh, 19th century landscape painters were the one of the uh, group of media in a sense which uh, presented information about the Alpine environment to a ever widening clientele mm -hmm. and in a sense who not only presented information but in a sense educated people to what to look for and so that I think in explaining the development of tourism in the Alps, you have to, would certainly, if you had a book on it, for example, mm. you would need to have a section, maybe a chapter or something, on the role of landscape painting in the development of the Alps as a, an environment recognized to be of aesthetic value. Mm -hmm. Part of the aesthetics appreciation coming through the, the, the work of the landscape painter. Mm -hmm. so, so your approach to landscape painting, unlike, we say, some other humanistic geographers, is not... Uh, you're not looking at it to give you insight into the nature of the Alps. You're, look, you're regarding it as one kind of perception or one method that was used to project an image of the Alps. Is well, yes, yes uh, except that I think we would probably also try if we could. I mean, that uh, I'd mentioned the, um, the tourist as, as the, the projection side of it uh, as an illustration because of the tourist uh, link. Uh, I'm not sure that, that uh, other than my wife and myself are sort of really competent to, to look at the second of those aspects mm. you mentioned, but it certainly is an area that we would try to, we're looking at, to see to what extent you can, through the landscape painting, uh, discover 
the relationship of the artist with the environment, and uh, uh, particularly the, the environment as a geographical phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think maybe the geographer has something to offer to the uh, art historians in, in their interpretation of present and, and past uh, attempts at depicting landscape environment. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes, it was Alexander von Humboldt's mm, dream. Of course, of course. Yes. yes. Now, you, uh, you, as you know, the whole field of perception has gone through a period of enthusiasm mm. and is now somewhat in the way. Yeah. You still believe in this approach, and uh, why? Yes, I still believe in the approach, um, the need to look at people's attitudes and to try to understand them. Um, to try to understand the learning process that we all have and go through. Um, I think part of the, the problem currently may be the, the difficulty of documenting it, of providing some basic ground st work studies, which people could build on. I think we have many ideas, uh, hypotheses, but we have rather few, as yet, uh, major works which have tried to test those hypotheses and produce some sort of definitive study of, of, of how these hypotheses do or do not work in a, in a quote, real-world situation. I think maybe um, some of the problems of, of the humanistic uh, approach currently, uh, in my view, seem to be that um, we now are at a stage where we have lots of hypotheses to look at, to check. Uh, we need to get on with the job of, of testing them, applying them to uh, the Alps or wherever it needs to be done. And empirical testing out would still be the criterion for credibility? Well, uh, I think so. Um, I, that, that's my personal view, that mm. uh, if, I can't, if I cannot find some sort of empirical evidence to support uh, the hypothesis, then I'm rather sceptical um, about its validity. I mean, I'm open to be uh, convinced, but I think that maybe it's the, the, the training that we had as, as undergraduates, the, the sort of emphasis, I mean, we went, we were trained up in the positivist mode, obviously, and uh, it's very difficult as geographers to uh, get away from the earth and the soil and uh, the soles of your boots, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so that we are naturally, I suspect, biased to the empirical study. Yes, but if you want to explain now these different evaluations of the Great Plains or the Australian Bank, mm. uh, you, uh, you either have to explain it in terms of individual learning process or perception, or you uh, resort to the uh, conventional assumptions about what real estate dealers will need or want, what, mm. uh, what private agents will need or want. In other words, you're falling back on either stereotypical models of how business should work or how rationality should work. Mm. You're not looking into cultural groups and their values and attitudes. Oh, well, you, you, you would need to, yes, you would need to do that. I mean, the, um, the work that I did on the plains in Australia was in a sense uh, it, it certainly was not a comprehensive view of the appraisal of the plains. It was, in, a, in the case of the Nebraska study, that was a view of the agricultural potential as seen through a series of uh, viewpoints, including the very practical one of the real estate uh, farm loan companies, but also the first land surveyors who were, were trying to pick out reasonable land for land settlement. Uh, practically materially oriented, mm. and to some extent also the same bias would be true of the, of the Australian study. The, the art uh, history component was perhaps a, a broader, more culturally oriented view. Mm. But, uh, oh no, I wouldn't um, say that this, this is the only way to do it. I must say right from the word go, I've been, tr been concerned to try, if we can, to provide some empirical evidence. Now, maybe um, the empirical evidence might be in, in terms of, uh, well, for example, I'm just thinking now of, of a farmer I knew uh, in the Mali of the semi-arid part of South Australia, uh, 
who um, lost his leg, his tractor rolled over on top of him, he lost his leg, in hospital for several times. He was a man of uh, great artistic ability, worked in leather, uh, wrote poetry, and some of the best poetry of the impact of drought on a wheat country is in some of his poetry. Now, in fact, in assessing the study of the perception of drought in that part of South Australia, one would have to include uh, as an essential component of an overall view, if you're trying to get more. Um, that is one element. Um, we've done, as part of what I was associated with Gilbert White's natural hazards work in drought. And um, as part of the study in the early 1970s, we did a sort of questionnaire, standard questionnaire survey. And of course, that's another side of it. Um, it was um, a bit criticized as imposing a sort of cultural imprint. Uh, in fact, we modified the questionnaire to cope with the local situation. And I think there were practical problems and it didn't always work out. Mm -hmm. But uh, looking back on it, it was a very useful means of getting local points of view and um, getting some rather wonderful uh, uh, descriptions of what drought meant. And uh, maybe the best definition of drought I've ever come across um, was a one farmer said, and I, uh, a drought is when you see two mallee trees fighting over a dog. <laughs> now that story is the Australian version, but I've seen an equivalent story, except that it's two uh, cottonwood trees for the plains. Now, why does, whether it's just sort of independent innovation, I don't know, but uh, there's no doubt that it's the same story, the same environment, just you change the trees. Um, so there's, there's a whole, you know, if, um, no, I'm not trying to say that uh, in going for the empirical, I, I'm meaning empirical, I'm meaning something which you can try to document, um, whether it is poetry, whether it is an interview, a taped interview such as this, or uh, some sort of data which can be reproducible later in time and can be then maybe reassessed, as mm. history is, but is there for the record. Mm. Mm. And would you still require a positivist way of handling this empirical evidence still? Up to a point, I suppose, in the sense that um, to the extent that you would need to maybe consider the evidence and see you whether the, uh, there's more evidence from this side or on the other, to sort of try and weigh up, if in that sense, of positive, the positive sort of evaluation of maybe counting up numbers of ideas, mm -hmm. one across the other. Mm -hmm. um, and you see future for perceptual research in geography? Ah, yes, yes, I think. Um, I think it's very important to continue it. Um, I always remember um, uh, one of these wonderful throwaway lines which uh, Professor Darby gave at one occasion, it, which I still think has a lot of um, value in it. He said, uh, this is of course in a British context, so it doesn't quite apply to others, but he said, geography enables you to read your newspaper with understanding and take your walks with interest. Now, that's, of course, in the British and Australia, you don't go for walks, you go for a drive, yes. um, as in the States. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that the, the role of geography is, is partly a sort of a, a, still a popular one. I mean, uh, I still have a lot of sympathy for the National Geographic. Mm -hmm. the, it, the fact that it sells an enormous number of, of copies shows that there is a, a basic public interest still cur innate curiosity about faraway places. Mm -hmm. And part of our job, I see, is to try and understand those faraway places. And one way of understanding why they're different is to try and look at the perception of the people living there and how they've been influenced by maybe people coming in, mm -hmm. and so on. So mm -hmm. Yes, could I then ask you your perceptions of Australia? What, hmm. is, what is it like to work in Australia? You who were born in England mm. and worked in, in America. Mm. Mm. Well, um, I went to Australia because I felt if I was going to make any contribution, <laughs> there are relatively fewer 
Australians, and therefore my chances of making a, a contribution which might be significant might be better there. Just statistically, you'll okay. flick a coin and that's it. <laughs> um, and then there was the, the, arid, the arid areas. I mean, there the, the was a possibility maybe of working in Britain and, and then obviously working in North Africa. Uh, but uh, I went to Australia. Um, it's a very uh, fascinating country in many ways. Um, it's, uh, I find it personally, my family found it a very pleasant place to live and you know, the traditional way and a good place to bring up your children. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways it's been a little disappointing that we haven't had as good uh, a, a group of students coming through. My only complaint about Australia is that we haven't, somehow maybe we haven't been able to tap as good, uh, we've had some very good students, that's not to say that we haven't, but we haven't had what I had hoped to be quite a, a, a fairly steady throughput of, of good quality students and so we've had problems there and um, that's my only real complaint but otherwise uh, the research potential is so vast and of course Australia from the point of view of European settlement was settled from the 19th century onwards by people, officials, who for all we decry the bureaucracy were very meticulous in amassing vast amounts of data, census data, these royal commissions, the, the um, official records in the various state archives, so that there is a vast body of data from which one can study the evolution of the present day Australian landscape. And of course, Australia at the moment is going through a very interesting period, um, well, from the 1960s and 70s onwards has been in terms of its changing cultural relationship with Asia, mm -hmm. taking in uh, fairly large numbers of uh, boat people, a uh, much more cosmopolitan society. Even between the time when I came out as, an, as a scholar, research scholar in 1960 and going back in 1966 to Adelaide, I could see the difference in terms of just Oh, restaurants and so on, a much more a cosmopolitan air about it. And um, so its position vis-à-vis -vis Southeast Asia, I think politically and culturally, is becoming very, rather interesting. And uh, there are strains, there are problems. Um, but it's got to be a very exciting place to be, I think, in the next ten years or so. That is very nice to hear. Hmm? Would you like to say a word on your present major research curiosity? What are you working on just now? Well, um, with uh, Professor McCaskill, I'm involved in the Atlas. In 1988, the Australians have their bicentennial, of course, and all the historians are all geared up, and the historical mm -hmm. geographers um, are sort of uh, tugging along manfully behind um, because there are relatively few numbers are involved. But um, people like Joe Powell um, is very heavily involved. And Professor McCaskill and myself were involved in one of the atlases, the, the, well, the, the, the atlas of, of a, a historical geography which we put out for the um, 1988 by 10th Tenniel. And I'm also involved in, I've uh, just finished a, a chapter for a book by the historians. It's interesting, the historians have rediscovered two things one, the region, and B, the cross section through time. So that they, as part of the, their contribution, the historians have sliced Australian history. 1788, 1838, 1888, 1938, 1987, 1988. And I've been involved in the 1888 uh, chapters of uh, Australia mm -hmm. 1888. Mm -hmm. That's, that's on this, to, to work with historians is very interesting to, to, because we have several very good economic historians who are, in a sense, really historical geographers in all but name. <laughs> um, yes. So we've mm -hmm. got on very well there. So that's one side, and I'm still trying to, still interested in the development of the arid interior and the problems of resource management. Um, there currently is a whole problem of um, degradation, Aboriginal land rights, mm -hmm. a whole series of managed resource management questions which are currently being debated and which, luckily, the people who are doing the debating are at least beginning to be aware of the historical background to the present problems. And, um, so I'm somewhat involved in that too. Mm. Fascinating. Mm. Mm. 
So you not only have your centennial in 1888, you will also host the IGU Congress. Right? Yes, <laughs> yes, we will be rather busy in 1988. So yes. we look forward to maybe seeing you again then, and I want to thank you so much for coming today and telling us of your background. Mm. Okay, well, thank you very much for the chance to talk to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, okay. Okay.